My name is Andrew Collins. Um, I'm a history and science writer, um, and I have been studying places like Gebekli Tepe and Karahen Tepe for a very long time. Now we'll tell you the whole story. But we'll also be trying to tell you the story of the people that actually constructed these monuments and what was going on in their minds over 11,000 years ago. And I think we're getting there. I think, you know, by the end of this, you'll see what was happening at these sites when they were constructed, as I say, 11, if not 11 and a half thousand years ago. But we start back in 1996 when my book, From the Ashes of Angels, was published. Uh, this is the cover that came out in America. It's obviously still available now. Um, and basically what it proposed is that what we call the Neolithic Revolution uh, was founded by a shamanic elite, you know, an elite group who thrived in eastern Anatolia, the country we know today as Turkey, following the end of the last ice age. Now, that ended around 9,600 BC. Um, and basically, I proposed that this Neolithic shamanic elite were remembered in legend as the watchers and the Nephilim of Hebrew tradition, but also the Anunnaki of Babylonian tradition. Uh, their name in Sumerian, by the way, is the Anunna, Anunna, which basically means the people of the sky or the sky people. And they provided, according to the legends, humanity with the rudiments of civilization, which in the Hebrew tradition is referred to as the arts and sciences of heaven. Uh, and in Sumerian tradition, it said that they gave us the gift of grain and sheep, which quite clearly is agriculture and animal husbandry. And the Watcher's homeland was said to be a place called Eden, which obviously we know from the book of Genesis. It was also known as heaven and paradise. Those are the actual terms that we use for it, uh, which was like a, some kind of mountain-like retreat. You know, not necessarily right up in heaven, but just at the top of a mountain. And in Sumerian tradition and Babylonian tradition, the Anunnaki was said to exist at a place called the Duku Mound, okay? And the Duku Mound was located on a heavenly mountain called Kasag, okay? And all of these locations were very clearly somewhere in the area of eastern Anatolia and the mountains surrounding them. You know, and I proposed that these were physical locations and that this is a memory of very real human beings, being, human beings that may have been different to the locals, as it were, but they were human beings of flesh and blood and that we refer to them as angels, as watchers, as Nephilim, uh, and of course as Anunnaki. Now, the Garden of Eden is obviously the story that we're told to do with Adam and Eve, and I'll go into that in more detail tomorrow. But it said that Eden and Paradise were said to be where the four rivers, the four great rivers, take their rise, okay? And two of those rivers are easily identified as the Tigris and the Euphrates. Um, and these both rise in eastern Anatolia. The other two rivers were probably the Artsis, which rises uh, in the Armenian highlands and goes east into the, uh, the Caspian Sea. And the fourth one is probably the Great Greatazar River, which also rises in eastern Anatolia. And then eventually it flows into the Tigris. Okay? And this was recognized as one of the four rivers of paradise uh, by the Syrian church, the oldest Christian Christianity. Uh, that emerged in this same region about the first century AD. And the, the fact is that there are traditions, lots of traditions, to do with the Garden of Eden being in this area. And as I say, we'll, we'll talk more about those tomorrow. But one of them is that the Garden of Eden was actually um, flooded at the time of the story of Noah and the ark and that when the earth was covered, uh, obviously, you know, there was a lot of water around, and it created this huge inland sea in eastern Turkey called Lake Van. And it said that 
it remains underneath Lake Van to this day. So what I proposed is that this shamanic elite that created civilization must have existed somewhere in the area of Lake Van, somewhere between there and the, the, the big city to the west of there, which is Diyarbakar. But at the time of the publication of the book in 1996, the only real evidence was the fact that from this area, a whole load of innovations and inventions of humanity had all begun in that area. Everything from the first beer, the first wine, agriculture, um, the animal husbandry, uh, the earliest pottery, uh, the earliest metallurgy, and a number of other things, all of which are the same things that are associated with what the watchers were said to have given us. Now, the book did really well. Um, it reached number 26 in the Times bestseller list. But as I was writing this book in the fall of 1995, what I didn't know on those dark nights that I spent, uh, you know, writing until six o'clock in the morning trying to finish this book, is that the first spades were going into the ground at a place called Gobekli Tepe, uh, very close to the city of Shanlurfa. Uh, anciently known as Urfa. And this is what they found, basically. I mean, a huge ceremonial complex on the top of uh, a low mountain at the edge of the Antitaurus range, which consists of a whole series of enclosures, stone enclosures, inside which are T-shaped pillars uh, which are all in the, 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 the dry stone walls, and huge monoliths standing at the centre of these structures. Um, I mean, this is, this is how Gebekli Tepe used to look like. It's now got a huge roof over it, so you can't take photographs like this anymore. But this was the site, and this was constructed on, uh, as I say, on the level bedrock, but was gradually built in stages across a period of 1,500 years. Um, and the dates for it are essentially 9,600 BC to about 8,000 BC. And after that time, the site was abandoned. The final enclosures were just covered over and the people went off somewhere else, okay? Probably even outside of Anatolia into Europe, possibly eastwards and even southwards down into India. But the, the, the precision, the sophistication of the technology involved with the construction of these monuments was incredible. I mean, the oldest structure, which is uh, Enclosure D, which this is the two central uh, monoliths, which are about 18 feet tall and probably weigh 15 to 20 tonnes apiece. I mean, is the oldest, and not only that, but the most sophisticated of the structures that are going on there. And across the period of the next 1,500 years, the structures actually got more simpler and smaller until eventually they were the size of a jacuzzi with tiny little uh, uh, you know, T pillars in them. So in other words, the best came at the beginning. How is that possible and what was going on? And these stones are covered in the most incredible art, mostly of animals or creatures of the natural world. You know, you've got here boars, snakes, cranes, foxes, Oryx, which is a big ball, gazelles, lizards, scorpions, arachnids, lions, vultures, wolves, waders, flightless birds, and various other creatures as well. It's like a menagerie, almost like a sort of Noah's Ark in stone, quite literally. But, I mean, the sophistication of this art is incredible. I mean, here, for instance, is a 3D sculpture on one of the stones, and this is the sort of thing that you're getting. You're not just getting high relief, but actual 3D animals that are extended out of the side of stones, like you see here. This is a predator, most likely a large cat, probably a panther. Um, and here's another one here, a um, beautiful panther. And you can see the actual shape of the stones has actually been created to accentuate the actual animal itself, as if it's like advancing towards you. Now, the person that discovered Gobekli Tepe was Professor Klaus Schmidt, a very enlightened and forward-thinking archaeologist, uh, German, uh, who discovered the place in 1994. Okay? I mean, he'd been previously working on another site called Navali Chori, which was almost of that age, but just slightly younger. And 
he recognised a few pieces that had been brought to a local museum um, as belonging to this same culture as Navali Chori that existed in about 8,000, 8 to 9,000 BC. And he went to see and thought, oh my God, we've got to start investigations. And those investigations began in 1995 and continue through to this day. And, but what he said was incredible because bearing in mind that, as I said, I was writing my book at the time that Gobekli Tepe was, was, was um, found. And it was not announced to the public until the year 2000. So that was the first time I got to hear about it. But what Klaus Schmidt wrote in his book, one of the only books that's actually available on Gobekli Tepe right now, other than my own, is that this was the place of the Anunnaki. This was the site of the Duku Mound. This was the place of Karsak and that the Anunnaki were either the builders of these monuments or the immediate ancestors of these builders, and that the T-shaped pillars themselves, which are anthropomorphic, that the actual T-shape is their head, the stems are their body, is that this is what you have here. These T-shaped pillars are the Anunnaki. They're the memory of them. That's what he wrote. And I thought, oh my God, you know, this is sort of confirmation to me that the Anunnaki were not only real, but that they were in this very, very area, the area that I had proposed. He also said that it was the watchers of this place, this was a term that he actually used, um, that created Gebekli Tepe. And I have no doubt at all that he was thinking of the watchers and the Nephilim of Hebrew tradition. So that alone, again, is confirmation that the watchers were physical flesh and blood beings, human beings, and that they were in this area quite clearly and were building this type of monument and were responsible for the rise of civilization. Now, I first got out to Gobekli Tepe in 2004, um, and the reason for this was, hold on, let's go back one, the reason for this was that uh, my book, From the Ashes of Angels, had been published in Turkish in uh, 2002, and it was immediately a massive hit all over Turkey, particularly amongst the Kurdish community, which it bigs up massively, basically. Um, and I was invited over there by the mayor of Diyarbakar to, to talk all about this at a big cultural festival. And the, bear, the mayor actually called me into his office and said, look, you know, thank you for what you've done, you know, for, for this part of the country. Would you write another book? on this area, and obviously all I could really say was, yeah, of course. And that ended up being a book called The Cygnus Mystery, which came out two years later in 2006. But here's me, obviously, at Gebekli for the first time. I mean, when I went there, not only was there nobody around, but there was not even a road to it. I mean, we had to walk, we had, we had to abandon a vehicle in fields and quite quick, literally walk through valleys and up hills to try and reach this position that we knew it was because it was marked by this lone mulberry tree, which was sacred to the local people. So eventually we found it, and this was the state that it was in, and that was that. Now, whilst I was there, and the, the, the mayor gave us a uh, driver and an interpreter for a whole week so that we could actually go around and see these monuments uh, firsthand, places that clearly I'd either uh, written about or, you know, were about to write about again. And one of the places that we went, and somewhere I'll be talking about later on, is Haran. Um, and this is only about um, 45 minutes drive away from Gebekli Tepe, uh, towards the south, on this huge, great expanse known as the Haran Plain. Um, and it has this incredible astronomical tower here in the ruins of what's known as the Paradise Mosque, which was constructed over a temple of the moon god Sin, in the seventh century AD. Now, we're there, and these entrepreneurial kids come up to uh, myself and what was then my, my wife, and they're trying to sell me this second-hand copy of a local guidebook. And I bought it, and I started flicking through it, and it showed a picture of a T-shaped pillar. And it said that this was one of a few finds that had been made at this place called Karahan Tepe. And I'd never heard of this. I was like, where is this Karahen Tepe? It said it was in somewhere called the Tek Tek Mountains. But 
the picture of this T-shaped pillar, which you've got on the screen here now, captivated me. I mean, I looked at this strange snake on the front narrow edge of it with this ball-shaped head and thinking, this is different to what we have at Gebekli Tepe. There's something different about this. I need to find this place. So a couple of days later, we went back to the same area and we just drove around the Tek Tek Mountains asking people and nobody knew where this place was. They'd never heard of it. Um, and then finally, you know, some guy in Arab dress, bear in mind we're really close to the, the Syrian border, um, you know, we ask him and um, luckily he does know and he sort of points us in a certain direction and we come to this farm called Ketchley and we go there and there's a little farmhouse and a kid comes out and the interpreter speaks to him and he just points like this to a hill towards the south. And that, obviously, was Karahan Tepe. And it was this bare hill, natural, and, you know, with some grass and soil around its edges. And so we go there, and as we walk towards it, I start seeing stone tools, stone tools that are as much as 11,000 years old, scattered about. And the closer you got, the more you saw, until eventually you were walking on them all. There was thousands and thousands of them. Now, I'd previously seen this at Gebekli as we were walking towards that. So this is clearly a, a major ceremonial centre. So, anyway, there's the map showing where it is. There's Karahan, uh, Gebekli Tepe up there, and Shanlurfa is the main city in the area. You can see the Haran Plain with Haran there, and you can see the Tek Tek Mountains, uh, which is where Karahan is. And this is me there in 2004 looking extremely perplexed uh, as to what was going on here, uh, looking at a piece of carving. Now, bear in mind there's nobody around at all. And this kid had just pointed. And we're there and, you know, we're looking around. And eventually this guy in Arab dress, full Arab dress, uh, you know, comes up and starts talking to the interpreter and the driver. And he's, he's clearly annoyed. He's clearly annoyed and, you know, he sound, he's obviously sounding off and then they all sort of kneel down, pass cigarettes around and start chatting and, and suddenly it's all okay. And clearly what they'd said is, look, you know, this guy is a, a, a proper archaeological student. Um, he's, he's here under the uh, yeah, protection of the mayor of Daya Bakar, you know, and the owner said, okay, because he'd been threatened with bad punishment if anybody was allowed onto the site. So we were very, very lucky to be able to go on it then. And what we found was T-shaped pillars, the heads of which were emerging out of the ground all over the place. I mean, we probably noticed maybe 20, 30, maybe, maybe more. And a few of them had these test pits around them, um, holes which had either been dug by the discoverer of the site, whose name is Batatin Chelak, um, a, a very astute archaeologist working in this field, or it was treasure hunters. Because the problem is that when these sort of sites are found, local men think that they can obviously find artifacts and sell them on the black market. And this is exactly what started happening at Karahan. And on one occasion, the owners of the farm had a knock on the door one night and it was these looters saying, would you give us a hand ta taking away one of these T-shaped pillars with, with the carving? And they obviously said, no, 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 we're not getting involved, you know. So obviously they couldn't take it away. I mean, you just think, thank God for that. So, you know, the family that, uh, the, that were there then, the Can family, um, are still there to this day. Um, the son, Ishmael, is, uh, you know, is, is basically one of the main guards of, of the site today. He's, he is also an archaeological student now, uh, and, um, you know, we often liaise um, our visits with him. So, you know, that, and that was that young lad who came out and pointed to the, the hill in, 2020, in 2004. So the other thing that you find there is these carved fragments, what we call porthole windows. Uh, there's me you know, with one of them on the left, there's another one above there. And on the right is what they look like. And they've been found at Gebekli Tepe, for instance. This one is in the centre of what they call Enclosure B. And they were either vertical, so that they, are, they were doorways into these enclosures, or some have proposed that they were actually in the ceilings of presumably wooden structures, 
and that people would actually go down from above, although that doesn't seem likely to me because these are so heavy, these, these portholes that, you know, as soon as the, the wood started rotting, they just fall in, but who knows? But anyway, these things are just scattered about. And what got me is that these carvings look like something out of a medieval building. I mean, you know, it looks like a, a so-called mullion, you know, from the, the window frame of, 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 you know, something that was constructed in the 14, 1500s. That's, but, and yet here was this precision carving going on. Anyway, so that, that was it. So I went to Corahan on numerous occasions after this. I knew that there was something important about this site and that, you know, just maybe when excavation started, then they would find something. And those excavations began in 2019 and continue to this day. And this is what Corahan looked like in the past. This is what it looks like today. A huge ceremonial complex with some of the most mysterious and strange monuments anywhere in the world. Far different, actually, from Gebekli Tepe. I mean, you know, to me, I'd done a lot of work on Gebekli, particularly to do its astronomical alignments, and they all sort of made sense. But something different was going on here, as we'll see. So that's what it looks like. This is what it's like from above. You know, you see here this huge ellipse here. You know, you see other, other interconnected um, structures, which we'll come on to one by one. And what we know at the moment is that the main sort of time frame of this is roughly around 9,000 BC to 8,000 BC. Although it is possible that it dates to a much earlier age, maybe 9,500 BC, we're not sure. My personal feelings is it's slightly later than Gebekli, and it may even have been constructed by an offshoot. Some kind of schism took place that allowed some of the people that were associated with Gebekli or a similar site to set themselves up in this very remote location in the Tek Tek Mountains, basically. Now, the archaeologists have now uncovered something like 250 T-shaped pillars, four special buildings, although, to be honest, that number now is probably doubled to eight, maybe even ten, even since I, I wrote this originally, and many other smaller enclosures. And the work is going on, and it's being coordinated by Dr. Nesmi Carroll of the University of Istanbul, who's also now in charge of Gebekli Tepe. Um, Klaus Schmidt, sadly, as Graham Hancock told us, died in 2014. So again, this is another image of the site. And once again, there's an incredible sophistication going on with this. And I needed to try and understand what was going on in the minds of these people. And I first got to knew about these discoveries in September 2021. Graham Hancock had been there the previous year to film the episode of Ancient Apocalypse. So he actually knew and he was told not to reveal anything um, when he actually did the filming. But anyway, what we now know also, and this was announced at the same time as, as Karahan, uh, all the discoveries made there, is that Gebekli Tepe and Karahan now form part of a much bigger civilization that existed in this region. Um, and there are now probably 12, maybe 13 sites that have all produced T-shaped pillars. Uh, these are all the sites here. Um, and the, they, the archaeologists in Turkey want to refer to this as the Tash Tepela culture. Um, Tash Tepela means stony hill, so it's a reference not only to the fact that they were building in stone, but that the whole area itself is, is incredibly, you know, uh, rocky, if you like. Um, that's the term they want to use. They are talking about it existing between 9,600 to 7,000 BC. Um, and this is just a timeline that you can see of it. Now, the other term that, that is used by archaeologists is pre-pottery Neolithic culture. And as far as we know, this basically relates to two periods, the A and B periods of the pre-pottery Neolithic, and that Corahan is towards the end of the pre-pottery Neolithic A. So it's about 9,100 to 8,000 uh, 800 BC is when most of these monuments started to be built. And obviously after that you have what's known as the ceramic uh, Neolithic, which is the Ubaid culture, uh, the Copper Age eventually, and then eventually the Sumerian civilization. And I have no doubt whatsoever 
that the Sumerian civilization thrived because of the knowledge and wisdom that was passed on by this Neolithic culture existing in Anatolia. And all the legends tell us that. The Sumerians themselves said, you know, their ancestors came from the north, from the very area of Anatolia. And of course, their, their divine founders were the Anunnaki or the Anunna. So the red ring here shows you where all these sites are. And they're all on the river Euphrates, okay? But to the east of them, on the river Tigris, are other pre-pottery Neolithic sites that date back even earlier and go back perhaps to about 10,000 BC. And, you know, amongst these are places like um, Halem Shemi, uh, Kortek Tepe, Chayono, uh, and various other ones which... Um, have incredible sophistication about them, but as I said, not the T-shaped pillars. It's quite clear that the T-shaped pillars are a development, but that the founders of the T-shaped pillar culture, the Tashtepala culture, came from the east at, near Lake Van. This is what we now know, and of course, that's exactly what I said. I said, that's where you will find this lost civilization, and now it has been discovered. So that's really, really important to know. So who were they? Who, what, who were the Tashtepala culture? Where'd they come from? Well, these are some of the incredible statues that have been found at Karahan Tepe and are currently on display at the Shanlurfa Archaeological Museum. I mean, you know, just look at them. They look weird, don't they? I mean, it's just extraordinarily odd stuff. But of course, from these, you can't really tell too much about the people that constructed them. Some of them have got round heads, some of them have got long heads, some of them have got two heads. No, no, of course not. Um, and this, I find, one of the most interesting sculptures that's been found at Karahan Tepe. I mean, look at this. I mean, this character has got massive brow ridges, um, this incredibly long face, massively large nose. And if I can show you it from the side, what the hell is going on at the back of their head? This is what we call an occipital bun. In other words, it has an extended occipital bun at the, at the back of the head. And in some ways, this is probably what the, the rear extension of the T-pillars is actually showing. And what's so interesting about this is that some of our distant cousins, you know, before the advent of, of Homo sapiens, had just such heads. Not as extended as that. Clearly, this is an exaggeration. And we're talking about the Neanderthals, but in particular, we think the Denisovans. And we'll come on to those. Because what I propose in these two books, the Cygnus Key and Denisovan Origins, is that the people that constructed Gebekli Tepe, that culture, came originally from as far east as Siberia and Mongolia. And that it was a journey that starts as early as 30 to 40,000 years. And we know that that journey took place because we can see the slow progress of a particular type of stone tool that comes all the way from Mongolia, just south of a huge inland sea called Lake Macau, all the way down into Southwest Asia and finally into Anatolia. And it's, it's a very specific type of tool and a means of, of constructing them, which is known as pressure flaking, which I'm not, I'm not going to bother to go into. But the thing that we know about the, the Denisovans, who are these cousins we didn't even know existed until the year 2010, when a little pinky bone was found in a cave called the Denisova Cave. And when this was, um, you know, analysed, it was, and, and the genome extracted, it was found to be from a completely unknown type of human being who they've since come to call Denisovans. And all the indications are that these Denisovans were of huge size, possibly as much as seven to seven and a half feet tall. You know, almost like the, you know, the biggest American wrestlers or football players that you can imagine. That's the type of build we think that they were. But they had incredible sophistication as early as 45 to 50,000 years ago. And this is just one example, this beautiful thing called the Denisovan bracelet that um, not only looks like it was actually turned on a lathe, but also it's got a hole pierced through it where, that has been looked at and it's got a feed rate of a drill that's comparable to a modern day drill. Now, if this isn't evidence of a lost civilization, I don't know. 
Uh, but that's not to say they had electric drills or anything, but somehow they were able to drill these things very fast and had the means to do it. Now, we'll talk perhaps about Denisovans tomorrow. I've got a whole intensive thing going on between about 9 and 12, uh, which obviously you're quite uh, welcome to, to come along to. But the importance of telling you this is that the story I've just said here about this journey starting from 30 to 40,000 years ago is exactly what the Turkish archaeologists are now telling us this. You know, just in 2022, last year, um, you can see this headline, Migration from Siberia Behind Formation of Gebekli Tepe. And they say the same thing as I do in these books, that there is like a paper trail of stone tools all the way from... Siberia and Mongolia, all the way into Southwest Asia, all the way to Gebekli Tepe. And that the ancestors of Gebekli Tepe and Karahan Tepe came from Siberia and Mongolia. Um, now, this is not to say they were the only ones that created it. Clearly, there was a lo- an indigenous population there already. But that indigenous population had to accept the arrival of this shamanic elite, almost certainly these shamans in groups that basically brought together the local population at the end of the last ice age and said, look, this is what we want you to do. We want you to build these structures and we will therefore care for you because there's been these terrible things that have happened in the sky, which Graham Hancock has talked about, this comet impact. Every time a comet comes into the sky, people are going to be scared that the world is going to end. And I believe that Gobekli Tepe particularly was built so that it would allow the shamans to enter into the sky world and deal with the supernatural creatures, the tricksters, that were seen to be responsible for these cataclysms, you know, which, th- which is the way that people would have interpreted what was going on at that time. Now let's look at the structures that have been recently found at Karahan Tepe. Now you've got this one here. It's what they refer to as structure AD. We call it the Great Ellipse, it's 75 feet across, and there's as many as 18 T-pillars in the walls, and two much larger ones in the centre, which are now just fragments, you can see them here. Um, benches around the wall cut out of the bedrock. So, in other words, the, the lowest part of this, this structure is cut out the bedrock, but what's so significant about it is that not only is it cut out the, the, the bedrock below, but the bedrock of the actual hill itself and you have the four incredible buttresses, which probably had T-shaped terminations on the front of them. And between them, you have what we call these stone thrones, which presumably is where officials or you know, the elders of the community would sit. And you know, so you've, this, this, this is the oldest rock architecture anywhere in the world. And this is constructed at least 11,000 years ago. But the thing is that it's not just randomly thrown up. There's a very specific uh, geometry involved with these monuments. And what I've been able to determine is that the Great Ellipse has a perfect... Now, I won't go into why we we think that it's specifically 32-27 as the ratio, but that is a number that's found in uh, in the works of um, Pythagoras, as very specifically associated with generating acoustics and musical sound. And this is something that obviously was known to Pythagoras and almost certainly he inherited from much earlier traditions. And what this tells us is that there's a strong possibility that monuments such as this, and we'll we'll see others at Gobekli in a second, were done with acoustics in mind so that performances, ceremonies and rituals the sound that was made would be carried and would probably affect people to do with altered states of consciousness. And this is something that even in the news this week to do with Stonehenge is now coming out, that these megalithic monuments were specifically designed to generate sound and to be contained within the framework of the actual stones themselves. Now, at Gobekli Tepe, myself working with the engineer Rodney Hale, who's mentioned in many of my books, also worked out that there was very similar designs at Gobekli Tepe, but they were a slightly different ratio. This was four to three. What I mean by that is for four, if, if the width of it is three units, the length of it is four units. 
And this was present in structures B, C, D, H, which is one of the new ones that's been found. But also, recently, two Israeli um, archaeologists, uh, A.V. Gopher, who I met a few years ago, in, in, and Marco Nadler, um, are both of the Tel Aviv University, discovered this, this, that the centres of these three particular enclosures at Gebekli were, on, um, were, were, were perfectly aligned with this, you know, this, this, this triangle, this perfect triangle. And when Rodney Hale overlaid it with what we'd already found, it conformed to the absolute centres of the geometry that we'd already proposed. So, you know, that's confirmation of both theories, you know, the, the geometry that these Israeli archaeologists are suggesting and obviously our geometry that we proposed and are already in some of my books. And, I mean, this is one of those enclosures at Gebekli with its geometry in place. And the cross-axis through it from, from south-southeast to north-northwest goes through the centre and hits this hold stone, what we call a porthole stone, which is in the north-northwestern section of it. You can see here, you can see that the full axis and the cross axis that's highlighted. And this is the reconstruction of that enclosure in Shanlerfa Archaeological Museum. And you can see here this porthole stone, although they've got it just slightly out of place, but it doesn't matter. And by the way, you can just get an idea of how massive these enclosures were and particularly the monoliths at the centre here, with me standing there and putting my eyes out and doing stupid things, obviously. Um, so there's the actual one, the real one, and it's got carving on it, um, which I think probably is an abstract representation of a, of a woman's you know, lower part, her, her vulva and womb and whatever. Uh, no, seriously, I do think it, it is that. It's in uh, Gebekli Teme, Genesis of the Gods. I, because, you know, these people were big into fertility, I think. I mean, it's something that uh, Hugh Newman and J.J. Ainsworth uh, are, are bringing out themselves to do with these sites. Incredible amount of fertility associated with them. But anyway, this is the whole stone there. The other big enclosure next to it, which is enclosure C, also has its hold stone in exactly the same position. This is enclosure C. There's the, 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 the layout of it, and there's its hold stone or porthole stone. It's broken and fallen out of place, but it's there, and we know exactly where it was. And that's there. You can see that. Now, the reason for telling you about these porthole stones is because there's another one within the Great Ellipse at Karahan. And it's like the ones that go back, every single one, it's in exactly the same position, the north, north, west. But the one at Karahan is slightly different because it's actually made out of a wall of bedrock that's been left in place. And it allows access by crawling through it into this second structure, which you can see in the top left-hand corner called Structure AB, or we call it the Pillars Shrine. And it's only 70 centimetres across, it's only about, about that wide, and it's very difficult to crawl through it. Um, but it's there, and it's slightly bigger than the ones at Gebekli. Um, and what's interesting about this is, you know, you think, well, what were these porthole stones used for? Well, the ones at Gebekli are what you'd call soul holes in German, Seelenloch, which allows the spirit of an individual, whether that be a deceased person or that of a shaman, to go from this physical world into the liminal world. You know, in other words, that a, a, a parallel world, call it the sky world, the underworld, the hereafter, whatever you want. But it allows you to exit. And why is it so small? Because it only needs to be the size of a head because these people believed that the soul or spirit resided in the skull. That's why they remove skulls uh, from dead people and reserve them for communication purposes afterwards because they believe that this is where the seat of skull. So in other words, that's all it needed to be. All these, these holes, these keyholes needed to be, they were the size of a human head. So this is structure AB. I mean, the, the important thing about this is that it's just phenomenal um, because what you've got is 10 pillars that are actually constructed, not constructed, sculpted out of the living rock itself. And you can see it here. 
And you've got this weird head coming out of the west wall from the actual direction of the hill itself that it's built into. Plus, then you've got a, a, an eleventh pillar, which is weird. We'll, we'll talk about that in a second. But the importance about this second structure, which we're talking about, structure AB, the pillar shrine, is that the geometry that I've previously described connecting with it, the southern end of its cross axis, there is this recess and there's like a, a cubby hole within this recess. This is clearly a really important spot within the structure and that a line taken from that position perfectly dissects the pillar shrine. Um, and in other words, the position of the pillar shrine is unquestionably positioned so that this line can cross through it. And it crosses all the way through the 11th and final pillar in there, which I've talked about in a second, which is actually not sculpted from the rock, was obviously done elsewhere and brought in and put in a slot. Okay, we'll talk about that in a second. But So here you can see it. But it also corresponds with the porthole stone between the two structures. So again, this is all deliberate. Uh, you can see here now third uh, structure we'll come on to, which is structure AA, a, a, which we'll talk about shortly. Now, this is it once again. Uh, I mean, it's 23 by 20 feet in size. Um, so you see the 10 pillars here. The, the, the one right in the middle that's slightly at an angle and slimmer, uh, I think we've got that as an image of it there. It's clearly done to look like a reptile. And I believe that it probably is a snake because there are lines that suggest the mouth, the head. In other words, it's a rearing snake that, that is about to attack, basically. And I think that it represents some kind of genius loci or spirit of the shrine, just in the same way that in um, yeah, Vedic, Hindu, Buddhic tradition, that Nagas, snakes, guard shrines and also buried treasure. I think this is the earliest manifestation that we have of that type of mind process at work. And then we come to this incredible head, which I'm sure many of you have seen pictures of. This is an extraordinary thing. I mean, it's twice, possibly even three times the size of a normal human head. And it's coming out of the wall and it's got a mouth open, which to me suggests that it's talking or it's trying to communicate with you. And when you stare at it right in front of it, which I've done on various occasions now, there's no question that it, it, it's like it's trying to tell you something. And that's the reason why the mouth is open. Above it would have been, we believe, a roof. So this whole thing would have been enclosed because there's actual marks and that roof would have gone right the way down actually onto the head itself, okay? And here it is from a slightly uh, different angle. And what we also know, and Graham Hancock mentioned this in his lecture, is that it's on this long serpentine neck with actual striations across it suggestive of the neck of a snake. And I have no doubt at all that this is some kind of snake genius, if you like. In other words, an anthropomorphized snake. Uh, here's obviously an example here uh, from the, the 13th century, sorry, 18th century, uh, from Persian uh, manuscript. And this, I think, is exactly what you've got here. So it's a snake coming out of the wall on the west side, so coming out of, of the actual hill itself, because the, 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 the hill blocks what you see towards the west. So, the snake would appear to be the primary token, uh, sorry, totem at Karahantepe. It's everywhere. It's on the side of the stones. It was on that stone I showed you, which had been uh, exposed in the late 1990s. Um, it, it's on many of the stones that, that are being uncovered today. And it seems as if there was some kind of ritualistic process that was going on here involving not just communication with a snake or snakes, but also a shamanic process where the individuals would themselves become snakes. Now, there are various 
cultures around the world, even to this day, where during rituals and festivals, people believe that they are being possessed by snakes and will fall to the ground and slither, quite literally, along, along the floor. And I think that something similar was going on here at Karahan. And I mean, we've only just started on stuff to do with snakes here, as you'll see. And what's so interesting is that probably the most common snake in the whole of the Tek Tek Mountains is the most poisonous snake in the whole of Turkey. Uh, and this is the, the, the Vipara Antolia, the Anatolian viper. Uh, obviously, there's, there's various uh, images of it here. And this is an incredibly important realization for something which I'm going to reveal to you for the first time publicly. Because the, 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 the structure that I've showed you, the, the pillar shrine, has behind it this, this very long, deep, winding curve, which Nesmi Carroll says is clearly serpentine in nature. So in many ways, it does represent the body of a serpent. Now, some people suggest it was used as a water channel, although I don't necessarily think that that was his primary function. The symbolism is what's important. But look at the shape of that pillar shrine. Look where it is in connection with that curved line. And somebody, just a couple of weeks ago, in Turkey, the day that we actually visited that shrine, said to me, do you know what that looks like? That looks like a human sperm. And I said, yeah, that's a great idea, but quite clearly these people back in 9000 BC would not have had microscopes, so how would they have known what a sperm looked like? And of course there was some debate over this, but at that moment I thought, oh my God, the actual shrine itself is a snake head. Look, look at this, look at the shape of it. And there is the Anatolian viper on it. That's a snake head. The whole shrine is a snake head. And that porthole stone that you go through is going into the mouth of a serpent, which I just think is, is just incredible. And I mean, yeah, this is, as I said, from a culture whose mindset, we strive to understand what the hell is going on. But this is a major, major discovery, which I'm revealing to you publicly for the first time. And, you know, this is already setting a domino effect, and we'll be doing videos about this next, uh, this week, and I've got to change a book that I was just about to deliver to the publishers to put all this in. That's a snake head, and that is its symbolic body. That curve is its body. I mean, clearly they couldn't do, you know, the, the actual body, that the actual size, because it would go on forever. Clearly. So they, they did this, this smaller curve to represent the body of that snake. And there's more snakes. Next to it is the structure that the archaeologists call AA. And what is this strange structure? You've got the huge great hole in the middle of it, this strange lip out to the edge, almost like a sort of diving board into a swimming pool. And on the side, We'll show you this. You've got this really long snake, another snake. It's here. It's difficult to see, but just take my word. You can just about see it there. And just beyond it, facing in the same direction, which is the north, is a relief of a fox. So you have a serpent and a fox together, okay? And so, as previously mentioned, obviously you have this line from the southern recess in the Great Ellipse through the Pillar Shrine. Does this give us some clue about what may have been going on there 9,000 years ago? We know that the, uh, the angle is 341. So, you know, what happens if you extend that line? Well, the answer is that you hit the second hill, which is just to the north of Karahan Tepe, called Kecheli Tepe. Well, that's what it's known today. It had an, another name in the past. But it hits there, and this, I think, is incredibly important for the reasons that we've shown. Now, myself and Hugh Noonman have investigated various structures on Ketchali Tepe, and some of these probably go back to 
the age of, of Karahan, which, by the way, is right in the back. There's me investigating these. And the reason why I've gone down there and wearing this is because we'd been warned by the local um, you know, farmers that there was poisonous snakes up there. This was, bear in mind, this, this is before these excavations started taking place in 2019. So we're expecting to encounter poisonous snakes in some of these caves that we're investigating. Luckily we didn't, but we did find evidence of, of snake skins up there. And there's me going down into what we call the snake pit, which is this huge beehive type structure. Don't know how old it is. We can't say that it's, it is 11,000 years old, but it's interesting. There are a series of caves, as I mentioned, um, and these have clearly been enhanced. I mean, here, for instance, you can see that there's a, um, you know, it's been, um, you know, chamfered off, you know, to make it into a rectilinear shape. Archaeologists are now looking at these structures finally, um, and they think that they may only be a couple of thousand years old, but these were natural caves. There's no way that the people at nearby Karahantepe would have ignored. No way whatsoever. You know, they'd have been seen as you know, almost like getting into the, the womb of some kind of, you know, earth mother or even a snake mother. So, you know, that's what I think was going on within the northern Tepe. So, as I said, this line goes to Kachelis. In other words, if you were standing on what we call the northern knoll, which is just above the excavations, and you were looking towards Kachelis Tepe, you know, that it would be right in front of you, and it clearly was important. So why was it important? Well, the fact is, oh, sorry, there's more structures to, to tell you about. Another one is what we call the rock, the rock temple, which is this huge rectilinear foundation that you can see here. Um, this was the, the plan that, that I did of it, and it's blocked on its western side by these two huge great boulders, which presumably were in place even before the construction of it, and block the site towards the west. And I think that this is something that, that, that was done deliberately, just in the same way that the main structures at, at Corahan are blocked by the hill on its western side. So once again, I think that there's a possibility that this structure could go back to the age of Tash Tepela and was used by the, the local community. Now, the significance of this alignment between Karahan and Ketchali is that if you extend it at the time of the construction at Karahan, it hits the setting of a bright star called Deneb in the constellation of Cygnus, the celestial bird. Uh, a celestial bird that is seen differently in different countries of the world. In Europe, where I come from, it's mostly associated with the swan or a goose. Uh, in America, it's associated with the turkey vulture, but occasionally with eagles and, and falcons or hawks. Uh, in, in the area of Gebekli Tepe and the Near East in general, is it associated with a vulture. Okay. Now, sorry, this is just this alignment. That the significance of this alignment is that this line from the southern recess through the pillar shrine itself hits the setting of Deneb, this brightest star, if you continue that through Cacelli, through to the local horizon, okay? And this is the same type of alignment that we find at Gebekli Tepe as well. The cross axis of various of the enclosures all target through their porthole stones, the setting of the star Deneb in Cygnus. So why would be this, this, this star be important? Why not Orion, why not Sirius or whatever? And the answer to that, as we'll show you, is that it is connected with the Milky Way. Deneb marks what is known as the northern entrance to this dark region of the Milky Way, which is the edge of our own Milky Way um, you know, system, called the Dark Rift or the Great Rift or the Cygnus Rift. And this is seen by various ancient cultures of the world as the entrance into the sky world. And that's the reason why these sites are aligned to that. And I mean, I've put this in various of my books and some of my colleagues have tried to shoot it down and whatever because they wanted to try and focus their attentions on the southern part of the sky. But in 2015, two Italian academics looked at this same problem 
And this was their conclusion in a paper called New Possible Astronomic Alignments at the Megalithic Site of Gebekli Tepe, Turkey. This was part of their conclusion. These orientations at Gebekli Tepe towards the setting of Deneb and the relative dating proposed by Collins have been verified. So, thank you very much. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's just good to, to get some confirmations occasionally that you're not just doing this for the sake of it, you know what I mean? And uh, as I mentioned, um, the, the, the Milky Way and the Dark Rift in particular is seen as this path or river into the sky world. And the souls, the spirits were seen to take this route to enter into the hereafter or the afterlife. And this is found all over the world. It's there in, in Egypt. Um, obviously, Graham talked about um, the, 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 the alignments towards Orion. But what we also know is that that was only part of the journey. The journey then continued along the Milky Way into the northern part of the sky, the so-called so circumpolar stars, the, the stars that revolve around the northern celestial pole all the time, where they would become as stars themselves and enter into the afterlife. And this is the reason why all of the, the, the pyramids have this tube-like uh, ascending passage that hits the northern part of the sky. So that's that. And also in amongst Native American tradition, my colleague um, Greg Little has done incredible work on the journey of the soul in Native American tradition. 30 to 40 different tribes have exactly the same tradition about this leap of faith of the soul going first to Orion and then going around the Milky Way and encountering this bird man called Brain Smasher. I kid you not. Uh, that is actually the representation of the stars of Cygnus as a bird man and that this will adjudic, you know, this will judge the soul whether it is allowed to go into the afterlife or whether it will have to go on another cycle of, of reincarnation or be cast into you know, the, the, the mouth of, of, of this monster which probably is represented by the stars of Scorpius which we'll talk about shortly. And there is one particular stone at Gobekli Tepe that seems to be the key to understanding the sky world of this Tashtapala culture. And this is Pillar 43. Now again, various of my colleagues have, have written about this. They've got some of their own views on it. But this, to me, is the most parsimonious, the most obvious answer to what is going on here. Because you have two sections of it. You have the stem and the head, a very big head, which has some very interesting imagery on it. And we'll only break down a few bits today, but in my books, I go into a great detail and a new book on Karaham, which, as I said, is about to be delivered to the, the publishers this week. We go into a huge detail. But here's what we know from a historical perspective. In 2010, an, an astronomer by the name of Juan Antonio Belmonte identified the scorpion as Scorpius, the, obviously the zodiacal sign of Scorpio, um, as the, you know, as on the, the stem of the, the stone. In the same year, quite separately, an Armenian um, uh, scholar, um, and I'm not going to bastardize his name, we'll, we'll, we'll leave that, you can read it on the screen, because I know there's, a, there's an Armenian gentleman and he'll tell me exactly how to pronounce it afterwards, um, of the Russian-Armenian uh, university identified the vulture on there as Cygnus as it appeared in the sky around 10,000 BC. Um, because what happens is that, that you know, due to what's called proper motion of stars, they slightly change their positions, or some of them do, because they're all moving in some way, or our perspective of them showed, means that they're moving. And the, what he showed was that this is exactly how Cygnus would have looked at that time. This is work also that my colleague, the engineer Rodney Hale, have also done. And what's so interesting, and one of the reasons why this, this Armenian scholar identified Cygnus in this role, is that in Greek myth, in the Near Eastern tradition, and in Armenian star law, and bear in mind that Armenia stretched into the area, right almost down 
to what is today Shanlurfa in the past, is that the stars of Cygnus are, and you can obviously read it in Armenian, for those that can, but I understand that the pronunciation is essentially angel, angel, which means vulture. Um, but because the, the word is so close to the word angel, that this is also seen as the heavenly angel as well. Cygnus is seen as the heavenly angel. So I find that really, really interesting that, you know, you're talking about a vulture that is an angel. And what I say in my books is that these angels were birdmen associated with vulture shamanism. But anyway, that's all fine. But as we've already established, the, it's the snake that's important at Karahan. So how does that fit into this? Um, you know, is it possible that this snake that's represented all over Karahan is astronomical in nature? Well, the clue to this is the fact that the third chamber, structure AA, is on a different actual uh, or directional orientation to the other two. And actually, it's in, it's in position in such a way that it curves around the northeastern side of Corahenta Bay. And, it look, and, and, and if you come out of there, you can see the western horizon, northwestern horizon, and, and clearly, obviously, the northern horizon. And when I saw this back in September 2021 for the first time, I thought, I think that's pointing towards something. And I had my suspicions almost from the word go that this was pointing towards sunset at the summer solstice. Um, so I, but obviously, you know, it's easy to say that. So working with Rodney Hale, we got the exact orientation of it, and it's roughly 302 degrees, you know, probably plus or minus, let's say, half a degree. And if you project that into the sky, you find that that is the exact position that the sun set in 9000 BC as viewed from Karahantepe. Not a coincidence. This was clearly aligned towards the sun at the summer solstice as it set down into the local horizon. So, you know, great. This is the oldest astronomical alignment, blind monument anywhere in the world. But this was just the beginning because my colleague, my colleagues, sorry, J.J. Ainsworth and uh, Hugh Newman, based on the fact that I'd discovered something going on at the summer solstice, went to Corahan at the time of the winter solstice, 2022. And they got there, and they arrived just about the point of, of, of sunrise, and J.J. noticed that the sun was shining onto the head inside the pillar shrine. And they realized very quickly that this sun was coming in through the porthole. Now, obviously, uh, Hugh has already talked about this in his own lecture. But, and then suddenly, it starts to illuminate the head completely. And what happens is like this sort of dart of light moves slowly over the face of this just a few minutes after sunrise at the time of the winter solstice and illuminates the head and only the head and bearing in mind that if, if this had had a roof on it this would have been absolutely spectacular now quite clearly there are other monuments around the world that have similar alignments like let's say Newgrange in Ireland for instance you know where you have this shaft of light at the time of the midwinter solstice come through this long chamber into a corridor and hit the central chamber and the sun will illuminate these carvings at the, at, the, um, at the extreme back of the chamber. And this happens just a few minutes after the winter solstice. And there are many other places, including Stonehenge. Most people associate Stonehenge with the summer solstice and the, 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 the sunrise there. But it also has a winter solstice sunset alignment as well, for instance, and possibly even sunrise. But anyway, that's not the point. What we're trying to say is here, all of this is going on in 9000 BC, many thousands of years before the Stonehenge or that we know today, or Newgrange, was actually constructed. So these people were quite clearly 
locking themselves in to the yearly calendar cycle, the solar cycle, using the solstices. This itself is a remarkable discovery. But there's more, absolutely more, because I thought to myself, well, is it only the sun that they were looking at? And here there's, um, you know, where the sun is setting at the time of the, the summer solstice as viewed from structure AA, which I call the pitch rhyme. There it is at 302 degrees. And if you then scroll forward minute by minute, hour by hour, on a sky program such as Stellarium, just two to two and a half hours later, something phenomenal takes place. And that is that at exactly the same place that the sun has set, the Milky Way is now vertical at that same position. So as soon as darkness falls, you see the Milky Way at exactly the same position. And this is something that you find in connection with solar alignments, solstice alignments, let's say in Peru, where the Incas were incredibly interested in the relationship between the sun, the solstices, and the Milky Way. But here it is in Anatolia in 9000 BC. But what's also so interesting is the constellations around it at this time, because not only does this mark the southern termination of the so-called dark rift, which we talked about in connection with Cygnus being the northern entrance or the northern start of that dark rift, but you have constellations around it like Ophiuchus to the right, Sagittarius to the left, and just set below the horizon on this particular date, but it would have been visible obviously at other times of the year, you know, let's say at the winter solstice, is Scorpius. So what's important about these three constellations. Okay, well firstly remember we're talking about snakes here, so is it possible that there's some kind of cosmic snake or a celestial snake in this area of the sky? And of course the answer to that, hold on, sorry I'll just repeat these ones again, the answer to that is yes there is. You have Ophiuchus which is known as the snake handler or the snake charmer that is holding stars that form a separate snake known as serpens. Here he is, here, holding it. And this is a tradition that goes right the way back to Sumerian times. In Sumerian times, Ophiuchus was known as the sitting gods. Strange name, I know. But the sitting gods was shown as this, this creature, uh, sorry, this person holding a, a snake's head or a, a person with legs that actually end in two snakes that, that come up and around. So in other words, this association and attribution goes back to Sumerian times. And what's interesting is that the sitting gods are associated directly with the Anunnaki and the so-called Duku mound, which we'll say we've already identified as either Gebekli Tepe or maybe more of these Taz Tepela culture occupational mounds in this area. In other words, it's a memory of this particular culture. But what's also interesting about Ophiuchus is that it's actually on the ecliptic. That's the path that the sun takes every year to move through the 12 signs of the zodiac. But what's interesting is that it's on the zodiac, sorry, on, on the ecliptic. And some people have even suggested that Ophiuchus is the 13th sign of the zodiac. And yet here it is, right where the Milky Way was at Karahan Tepe back in 9000 BC. But the other important thing is that Scorpius, even though we associate Scorpius to be a scorpion, literally, obviously. In many traditions, it was also a snake. In fact, almost certainly some of the oldest traditions, Scorpius was a celestial snake. So, you know, that's interesting in its own right. And there are more clues from Gebekli Tepe to show that there was a cosmic snake in this area of the sky. Let's go back to, um, to Pillar 43. My colleague Rodney Hale was able to overlay the stars of that period over the head and stem, the carvings on that particular one, one, and showed that not only is the vulture Cygnus, as had been previously proposed, and that the scorpion is Scorpius, but that the strange ball that's actually over the wing of the vulture 
corresponds perfectly with the, the celestial pole, the northern celestial pole. And this was seen by many shamanic cultures, particularly in places like Mongolia and Siberia, as what they refer to as the hole in the sky, the entrance into the sky world. So that's what that represents, amongst anything else, the entrance into the sky world. And the vulture is guarding that entrance. That is the actual point of entry into the hereafter. So that's interesting. But if that's the case, then in this school if this scorpion is Scorpius, then what about what's going on on the left-hand side? Now, Pillar 43, strangely, it's got carvings which we don't even know what's fully on them because it's been embedded in a stone wall and you can only see part of the actual thing. Let me show you a picture of it. Look, you can see here that there are other creatures to the left of the scorpion. Well, we know that one is a, quite clearly a snake and the other one below it is a fox. Where have we seen that before? A snake and a fox together? Oh yes, of course. Structure AA at Karahantepe, where they're both actually next to each other. And if we highlight this and zoom in, in the knowledge that the scorpion is Scorpius, you can see that that snake is in the area of Sagittarius, and quite clearly the fox is nearby. So they, these people must have believed that there was a celestial fox in the sky somewhere in the vicinity of Sagittarius stroke Ophiuchus stroke Scorpius. Exactly where we don't know, but I, I go into this. There are some traditions from, from Egypt and other countries that do talk about a fox in that area. So what was this cosmic serpent so close to Scorpius, Sagittarius, Ophiuchus, and also the southern termination of the Milky Way's dark rift, which, remember, is the entrance or the point of beginning into this, this route that goes up to the sky world via the Milky Way. Well, the answer, and I pondered on this for a long while, and eventually it came to me, it's the Milky Way. Of course, it's the Milky Way itself. I mean, today we hardly see the Milky Way, but to the ancients it would have been this incredible arched bridge across the sky. I mean, I've only ever seen it once. I was in the desert somewhere. I, I can't remember where I was now. Uh, probably Martha in Texas, I think it was, where weird lights appear. And I think I saw it for the first time. I thought, oh my God. And you could see it going from one horizon right the way across to the other, just like this image here. And universally, we know that the Milky Way was seen as a world-encircling snake, okay? Here, for instance, on a, uh, a boundary stone uh, known as a Kuduro from the Kassite period of Babylonian rule, probably dates to about 1500 BC, you can see this snake arching over the sky. All the rest of the, the, the carved relief are themselves, constellations, you can see Scorpius here, you can see these seven stars next to it, which are the Pleiades. And I'm certain that that snake is the Milky Way. And this is what it was originally. Obviously, there, there is a, uh, a fox there as well, but that's that. Now, Herman Bender um, of the Hanwakan Center for the Prehistoric Astronomy, Cosmology and Cultural Landscape Studies in Wisconsin has made um, an examination of rock art and effigy mounds in North America. And he has come to the conclusion that they represent the Milky Way, or if not the Milky Way itself, some kind of bridge over it. And he cites many, many different examples. Uh, his work's freely available online. Uh, I mean, here's obviously some, some rock art from uh, Wilson's Cave in, in Indiana, recorded by uh, William Pigeon. Uh, in 1858, uh, and of course, there's Serpent Mound in, you know, which in in this country in in Ohio. Now, Graham Hancock has done a lot of work on this. He's talked about the fact that it's aligned through the head towards sunset at the summer solstice. Obviously, we've seen that in connection with Cara Hand now, but it's but the work by William Romaine, who is an archaeo astronomer, has shown not only that, that, you know, that this alignment is correct, but that at this time, there's a specific relationship between this effigy mound 
and the constellation of Scorpius. And that he thinks that it possibly does represent Scorpius in its role as a serpent of the sky. And I, I think that he's basically got this. I think that it's right. I mean, it, it could be the Milky Way itself, but it could be Scorpius, because I think the Scorpius, in its role as a snake, is the active spirit of the Milky Way serpent. In other words, it's what's literally coming out of its mouth. But look at this. At the mouth of Serpent Mound, you have this strange egg-shaped thing. What is that? And it's found on various other uh, effigy mounds and snake mounds and rock mounds that are found in North America. Here you see it right in the centre. Um, where is this? On uh, Turkey River, uh, in the, on the Mississippi River. Again, this was recorded by William Pigeon in the mid-19th century. So what is, what is this strange egg? Well, there are traditions within orph orphism that talk about a cosmic egg being either produced or guided by a great serpent. And I'm going to show that this is exactly the same thing. This is a symbol of creation. Um, and, but if that's the case, what is this egg? And what is the head of this Milky Way serpent? And the answer is, and I have no question that this is correct, is it's the, what we know as the galactic bulge. The galactic bulge is a part of the Milky Way in the area of Scorpius, or Ophiuchus, and Sagittarius that marks the centre of the Milky Way galaxy. And I think that this was seen as the head and the point of communication with this cosmic serpent. And in the past, this would have been much, much brighter. And what do we have at the centre of our galaxy? But something we refer to as a supermassive black hole. Its correct astronomical term is Sagittarius A star because it actually falls within the boundaries of Sagittarius. Uh, although it's on the edge, on the boundary between Sagittarius into both Scorpius and Ophiuchus. So in other words, it's in the very area of the sky that this alignment at Corahan is pointing towards at the time of the summer solstice, okay? So, is it possible, therefore, that these people were not only communicate, trying to communicate with some kind of cosmic serpent, and particularly its head, but also galactic centre itself? Now, clearly these people probably could not ever have known that the centre of the galaxy was here. But they would have seen this very bright thing they could have interpreted it as a serpent's head or even a, 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 an egg within the mouth of a serpent. And clearly they could have seen it as a place of creation, a place that they could see as a cosmic source of the motions of the, um, you know, the, 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 the universe as it goes around, the planets, the stars, you know, the sun, the moon, you know, a dynamic force that has its deep source in the area of the galactic bulge. And there's even more evidence at Karahan that they were interested in the galactic bulge because Hugh and JJ discovered the midwinter solstice alignment there and they said, and, and Hugh said to me, he said, look, could you have a look to see if there's anything of interest going on in the skies at night, you know, the night before or the night after or whatever. So I looked, and initially there was nothing obvious that was just below the rising of the sun. In other words, something that would have been seen just before the sun rise, so called in a heliac, so called heliacal way. In other words, with the sun, some kind of constellation that really made sense. But I persisted and realised something incredible: that in the night prior to the winter solstice, the Milky Way would have risen horizontally when looking due east, the exact alignment of the great ellipse at, at Corahan, and that as this rises up due east, Scorpius and the galactic bulge would appear right in front of you, and that if you were sitting on those thrones, that's exactly what you would see. In other words, they would be waiting for this to happen. And then obviously just a few hours later, the sun rises, the light 
penetrates through into the pillar shrine, which we've now identified as the head of the great serpent itself. Clearly, this is a representation of that cosmic serpent. And so, you know, and, and, and with all this, you've got galactic center. I mean, this is all just extraordinary stuff for 9,000 9,500 BC. I mean, this is the sort of stuff you would expect perhaps to do with Stonehenge or something. But no, it's there at this early period. This is what I think is going on in connection with the mindset of these people back then. But there's more. Now, we all, I think, remember 2012. And, you know, and what was going on there? Well, um, my colleague John Major, Major Jenkins, who's sadly no longer with us, wrote a series of books about the galactic alignment on the winter solstice on 2012, and that very gradually, across the thousands of years, the sun would eventually synchronize with galactic center, and that this event would take place on that date. And of course, many people celebrated it, many people see it as a nexus point, you know, into the new age or the age of Aquarius or whatever. Okay. Now, but the fact is that this synchronization is still going on today. I mean, now it takes place just a few days earlier. But I mean, this, this is, if you're looking at it from an astronomical point, of, sorry, astrological point of view, this is where galactic center is now, the winter solstice in the year 2000, or you know, the, the epoch of 2000. That's where it is. And obviously opposite that, you've got summer solstice, and obviously in between those you have the two equinoxes, the two periods of, of equal day and equal night. But if you go back to 11,000 BC, galactic center is perfectly aligned with the summer solstice. And I'm pretty certain that the forerunners of Korahantepe were very much aware of this and that these ideas, even though the synchronization was starting to go out of, of sync by about 9000 BC, that this is what they were still trying to focus their minds towards and that they had been aware of this alignment since around 11,000 BC. And I think it's no coincidence that this is also around the date of the Younger Dryas comet impact. And I'll be bringing out in the book the whole relationship between that and this alignment in that book. And I, you know, there's some very, very interesting stuff there, but we won't go into that at the moment. So was the influence of galactic center seen in terms of a cosmic serpent reachable through shamanic practices involving the snake as a power animal? Um, I have no doubt that the answer is actually yet. If so, then was it conscious? Are we dealing with a true entity here, a true cosmic being at the center of our galaxy? Well, one of the great thinkers of our time is Rupert Sheldrake. And he's written some incredible material across the years. But recently, he wrote an article called Is the Sun Conscious? And he proposed that our own sun is a living being, just in the same way that the Earth, Gaia, is alive. But he went further in this article and suggested that galactic center, the supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy, is a sentient being. Now, we don't have to see this in terms of God sitting on a cloud. I mean, it could almost be like an AI-like sentience that's seen as a dynamic force controlling the movement of the heavens. But I like this idea. I think this is very important. And if this is correct, then I think this, is, this was exactly what the people at Korahan Tepe were linking to, the center of our galaxy as a sentient being. Of course, they saw it in terms of a serpent. But what's so interesting is that many ancient cultures through to medieval times and later, even the Rosicrucians, believed that there was another sun, a sun behind the sun, what is academically known as the hypercosmic sun or the super celestial sun, and that it was outside our physical universe, but that it rained down its energy 
and could manifest in the form of a great serpent. And this is the belief of the Orphites, the, the, the followers of the god Orpheus in Greek tradition, which, by the way, was very strongly prevalent around the area of Chandlerfa, just a few miles away from Gebekli Tepe. I mean, this image here, for instance, was the interpretation of this concept by the British polymath and philosopher um, and Rosicrucian, Robert Flood, at the beginning of the 17th century. And this was believed to be the ultimate source, the ultimate God, basically. And of course, it was not just the, Orph the, 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 the Orphites that, that believed this, you know, the, the followers of Orpheus, but also the Orphite Gnostics, who obviously existed around the early centuries of the Christian era and had their own take upon you know, the, the God as the creator and the manifestation of, of, of our world. They also recognized this, div this invisible divine sun as you trade on this alabaster bowl of Gnostic origin. The sun is there, and what manifest from that was a great serpent, and that this great serpent was the creator of the world, what they called the Demiurge, okay? But the Orphites, sorry, the, 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 yeah, the Orphite Gnostics, Orphite simply means snake, by the way, so it's the Gnostics that followed the, the, the snake doctrine, was said to have been inspired not just by Orphism, which had preceded it, but also by the astronomy and astrology of the Chaldean astrologers of Haran. And of course, this is where my whole journey begins, by those kids coming up to me and selling me this battered old copy of a guidebook that showed me that picture of that stone at Karahantepe for the first time. And I thought, oh my God, I need to find this place. And this is where it was. This, I mean, the, and Haran, therefore, inherits the traditions of Karahantepe and the more deeper, darker side of the Tashtepela culture. I mean, to me, I see Gebekli Tepe now as like a, a cathedral like a Catholic cathedral with loads of chapels and grandeur. But to me, Karahan Tepe is like a Gnostic church where something deeper, darker was actually going on, more shamanic. And that they really wanted to find the cosmic source of everything. And of course, what comes from all this is the foundations of astrology. And the foundations of that come from Haran. And so, was the knowledge imparted by the cosmic serpent remembered in terms of humanity's fall in the Garden of Eden? Which, remember, is here. When the serpent gave Adam and Eve the forbidden fruit, what was that, what was that fruit? I'll tell you tomorrow in the intensive. Learn, no, well, I've got to plug tomorrow, haven't I? Uh, learn how... In, oh, it says it here. Learn how in the intensive workshop tomorrow. All right, okay, yeah. All right. So anyway, okay, last slide coming up. Well, other than the adverts. Was the great serpent of Karahantepe the true serpent of Eden? Was it the same serpent, the creator of the world, the demiurge of the Orphites and the Gnostics? And for me, the answer is yes. And this is the beginnings of what we might call our understanding of God, understanding of the creator of this world. Thank you very much.